All right, Stan, let's get started. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. I am the, the CEO of Maverick Kim Research Institute, and we have on the panelists today with the webinar is Stan Keith, the president, Dr. Jan Rasmussen, who's uh, doing the, the organization, the publications, everything you see on the website, she's able to compile that and allow us to, to get some really good information on the website, all completely free. All you have to do is register. Click the register button and uh, the Keith 1991 paper and the Magma Metal Series approach. So the Keith 91 paper, when you register, is completely free. That's our membership publications. There's nearly 100 of them. And it's, it's, it's all the documentation and publications of Stan and Jan and Monty, the Magma Chem team through the years since the early 80s of writing publications to today. What's the latest? What's the greatest? How they developed all these ideas? It's all there, but the Magma Metal Series approach is what we're calling a Magma Chem publication. And you can only get that through mcri.org. So magmachemri.org. And it's, uh, you know, it's a nonprofit where we are scraping together our time and attention and effort to make these webinars a thing and get, continue the publications. And so for that one, it's a minimum donation of uh, $25 gets you the Magma Metal Series approach. That's a 2020 document. That's tying it all from the beginning to present after the discovery of the Serpentosphere and the UDH model and everything that happened with Stan and the Magnum team from about 2000 to present and the upper crust part of this story, linking it to the layered earth model, all that stuff. It, that's, that's what that document is. And it's incredible read. It's fascinating data. It's an incredible story. It's all there. It's, it's really, really fun and entertaining and very educational. So check that out. Uh, 2021 webinar series, we call it the geology of Western United States from a magma chem perspective. It's, this is an unfamiliar perspective. It's not in the textbooks. It's not what's taught in academia. Industry is using it, but not everyone's using it. It's, it's incredible. Uh, it's, it's, it's a whole model that, uh, that allows us to, to take data and, and make some distinctions that are very unique and specifically unique for prospecting, for finding mineral deposits, for exploring as geoscientists. That's what Stan is. He's a true explorer and a true scientist. Um, so we're gonna focus on geology of West United States. This is huge. Today, it's about Arizona. Today, it's gonna be, uh, we'll get to the end of that, but it starts with what is the Magma Metal Series classification and how does it work? I literally wrestle with Stan intellectually and Jan and everybody else. I go, what is going on here? How does this work? How'd you guys actually build this thing? Well, we are going to go into detail the seven layered logic of how you get through the Magma Metal Series classification in order to make a distinction or an interpretation and a prediction that you have something of economic value. Not that you just have the potential for copper, but statistically you have an economically viable resource here that has been combined with all the worldwide data of magma chem to make that distinction, right? So the probabilistic modeling, if you will, or the probability for success when you use this model, it drastically increases our ability to make these predictions. So allow me to read my take, latest and greatest take of, of the, the first bullet point here. It's empirically evidence-based layered classification of magma chemistry and metal mineral associations linked in time and space. In a given model, the data is repeatable, specific, it's source-based that suggests cause and effect predictive relationships between a magmatic source and its hydrothermal product. You determine in one layer at a time from general to specific layering, the uh, and so the boundaries of all the magma <clears throat> The boundaries of all the magma chem plots contain off-plot information about the associated mineral deposits, which we uh, which were used to help draw the boundaries of the variation diagrams that you're going to see in this presentation. These lines are put together from Stan and the and the team for many many years with a ton of data. That's how these boundaries are actually drawn. It has immediate exploration implications because of the tie into mineral systems totally different from academia survey type classifications two major point it allows one to determine the tectonic setting from the magma 
petrochemistry, which gets us to the second major bullet point. Again, these we're going to constantly be tying all this in throughout the whole webinar series for the rest of the year. Today, we're talking about Arizona. But when you get the petrochemistry and you put all this data together, you are now looking at a surface map of petrochemistry across West United States. And it's telling us at this time slice, 89 to 72, when you have all this compiled and Stan and Monty and the team put this together, this is the implied tectonic setting during this time. And now all of a sudden, if you're standing on a random outcrop in Arizona, you have a geologic model that allows you to go north, south, east, and west and make predictions. And that is, is fascinating. That's fun. That's really cool. Anything else on the, uh, the geologic implications, Stan? Well, I mean, as you go, you're making fundamental tectonic distinctions. So, like, for example, when we do the paraluminous metaluminous distinction, you're distinguishing from magmas and ore deposits made in the crust in the paraluminous case, and that is also made in the context of flat plate interaction, either with a subduction zone or a continent-continent collision. And now you can go both ways, because now if you're in paraluminous, you know your source started wet. If you're in metaluminous, you could probably make the assumption that it started dry. Now you're talking water content. Later, you're, you're making these connections from both ways. Whatever data you have, you, you can integrate and innovate. Synthesize. Yeah, but it also, uh, the, the negative aspects of the thing are important because if you have a copper occurrence associated with a paraluminous granite, like you do in a few places in the Catalinas north of Tucson, mm -hmm. that is not going to be a porphyry copper type setting. This thing came along after the porphyry coppers and was the real laramide orogeny. Porphyry coppers were just a pregame warm up. Wow. But it's the negative aspects of this as well as the positive aspects that are important because you can interpret the yeah, same, same thing. If you're in one of those orange alkali calcic things and you uh -huh. see a good copper occurrence, stay away from it. On the other hand, if you want a good zinc play, that's a place to be. <laughs> so it's, it's negative, toxic. positive, you, you use the whole system. today. Yeah, again, the negative is just as important. It's what it isn't that it tells you as much about what it is. Love it. Uh, today we're talking Arizona. This is just porphyry copper plates. This is nine brown fields and eight green fields that Stan and the Magmachem team have highlighted with all this research and work they've done in the last three years on this Mineralogy of Arizona textbook. All the economically potential things that have dropped out. That's what we're going to get to in the later part of this specific presentation uh, today. <sighs> One more major point that Stan wanted to make as we'll go to the website real quick. Um, this is last year's webinar and so the the webinar series this year is all about basically from the 19 late 1960s when you're originally mapping and you started putting the story together <laughs> to about 2000 which is the magma metal series classification that's all mantle layered model that's all this stuff the udh part of this was not possible without all that work that happened before 2000. With that foundation, Stan was able to then take it even further with the UDH model. So when you go into our website, and again, this is all free to everybody that registers, you will find the geology of carriage the geology of serpentinization, steatization, diamondoids, mud volcanism, an incredible journey around the globe of compiling data and making sense of it using the UDH model. Uh, and so... Take a, take a look at all that. It comes with the recorded webinars that are edited down to, to be you know efficient to deliver information, and you also get the presentation. So that set us up for 2021. We are going to go hard into the metals. We're going today hard into Arizona, but it's it's hydrocarbons, it's graphene, it's metals. It has this state is a geologic wonder, and uh, and let's get started. Stan, what do you think? Well, just for openers, hydrocarbon deposits are not biogenically sourced. They're ultimately magmatic and deep sourced. Yeah. They have a UDH story to them, and you'll, we'll see a little of that towards the end the at the Dinabakea field. Right. Okay, so uh, this actually follows on a talk that we gave a week ago <laughs> mm -hmm. to the AGS Society, and, and we've vastly expanded it into a two-hour format. Uh, and uh, so we talked briefly last week, but we'll expand on it some more about the paraluminous 
uh, and the alkalinity distinctions and the oxidation state. But an extremely important one that we're going to talk a lot more about today is water content, which is part of this water planet. So we'll go through the various exploration implications of each one of the distinctions. And then we'll uh, talk about 10 potential prospects for Arizona. So you're looking at what, one through six? One through six, seven through 10. Yeah, we talked about the first four a little bit last week. We'll have a few more things to say about then, but we're gonna spend more time focusing on five through 10. Right. So, and that, that's all available on our YouTube page, the AGS presentation, get it through AGS website as well. Uh, the first four economically potential mineral systems in the state. Again, we'll go through uh, five, six, seven, and eight. You want to go through them real quick or just uh, get started? Uh, we'll just get started. Okay. Uh, we'll end it with the alkaline hydrocarbon diapir, this Denebakea story that's incredible. No, we'll end it with the graphene. Well, I was going to add that to the end. Yes, two <laughs> points to the end. <laughs> Denebakea, hydrocarbon story in Arizona. Very prospective, certainly for me, coming from the oil and gas industry, I'm going, wait a minute, what are the volumes of oil that are coming out of this basalt? Uh, that seems Alkaline economic. Alkaline basalt. Uh, and then yellowbird graphene, a graphene story that's in western Arizona. Wow. Graphene is, is uh, just such an exciting thing for engineering and, and the progression of renewable energy. Graphene's a, a Ultimately, it might show up in e-cars. Oh, yeah, it definitely will once we, we figure it out. Okay, Stan. Okay, so uh, this is just an uh, introductory slide, just showing some fun and games. Uh, but the, again, a lot of the inspiration and the work behind this came out of the work that Jan and I were asked to do for the new mineralogy of Arizona, and that is not necessarily going to be the cover. This is just a placeholder at this point. But we have just received... Uh, notification that the U of A is going to go ahead and they have made a positive decision to absolutely publish this. So, uh, and Sometime. they're very pleased with it. End of the year, potentially? At least a year. I, maybe in time for the next Tucson Gemma Mineral Show in uh, 2022. Wow. Wow. Cool. And we'll be selling it at our electronic booth. <laughs> well, maybe it's not virtual in 2022. Maybe. Well, who knows? We're, we're going virtual this year. Tucson Gem and Mineral Show. Shout out. They have a great virtual platform. Uh, check out Tucson Gem and Mineral Show from anywhere in the world. It goes from January 31st to uh, February 14th. It's it's fascinating. We got a booth there. Men, dad, uh, major guys are showing up to that. It's really cool. Okay. So uh, the maps that are going to be in uh, the new fourth edition uh mineralogy of Arizona are based on this original map that I put together along with another team that was at the uh, geological survey in, uh, and it was published in 1983. And uh, you could see the explanation there on that side is not really built in the context of the magma metal series although there was some nascent magma metal series stuff going on that didn't get incorporated in this one that's another story but uh <laughs> the key point about the first map though is it's it took the concept of a mining district which had been around for since for a hundred years at least which is a geographically distinct area that is name for a nat nearby uh, natural geography or a mine. And then it was basically uh, an area of mining activity for any particular commodity. And of course, in Arizona, they were looking for copper, but they've, you know, we've had silver, we've had other things, copper, zinc. And it was just the area of where they were mining. And in so many cases where they were mining was different geologically. There were several systems within that broader mining district. So what I did is took the more specific pieces of the economic geology and integrated them into the concept of a mineral district. And I drew a line around that to indicate uh, that everything within that line was geologically consistent with a given mineral deposit model. 
Uh, and then as, it, as things went down the road, especially in Arizona, it became pretty clear that a lot of these hydrothermal uh, metal systems were actually spatially and temporally related to a certain kind of magma in wow. terms of their timing, go back to that, and other geologic processes in, uh, evolved in the formation of the minerals in that system. So that's what those things are. Uh, again, there. Uh, go back to the map a second. The boundaries on these things are only as good as the information I had at the time. And and since then, when we redrew these maps, uh, <laughs> 40 years of new information has tumbled in, and many of these outlines have changed. So there's nothing magical about those boundaries. They change in space and time as a function of our knowledge base. What are these uh, these KT and MT? Those are uh, age assignments, Okay. broad age assignments. Now, the newer maps go to the next one. This is the newer map, roughly, of the same area. And uh, in some cases, the outlines are quite similar. In other ones, they're quite different. And uh, now what they have is they have the magma metal series classification. So to actually play with this, you have to read the paper that the chapter, I think it's four, is that right, Jen, or is it three? Uh, it, it's yeah, going to be chapter four. Chapter four in the new Mineralogy of Arizona book. It's going to explain some basics on what is an MAC, what's an MCA, what's PC. But in this presentation, you're going to get a lot more. Right. Because we're these... going to give you the hydration state of the magma and all, all, all of that. And and then you have the commodities listed out with the majors and then the minor commodities and then a specific age assignment in millions of years. So it's a lot more precise wow. and a lot more predictive. Uh, and this is the explanation for it. And it includes UDH ultra deep hydrothermal systems, right? which we think oil are related to. And then Believe it or not, there are some mineral deposits here that are not igneous in character, like uh, gypsum deposits in San Pedro Valley, et cetera, et cetera. So gearing up for what we're really going to talk about, one of the major distinctions is between the M's and the P's, uh, these guys. So paraluminous, metaluminous. Make sure to keep note on that. Paraluminous, metaluminous, the M's and the P's, the colors. This is all in regards to this massive amount of data that's been compiled and synthesized to make economically viable predictions about a deposit. Okay, another, another thing that's come out of this is the concept of a super system. And that's a geographically distinct area that contains the same metallogenic type that basically implies the existence of a larger batholithic source uh, in the middle crust within that outline. So that's sort of a midi metallogenic uh, province, in this case, uh, tuned up for paraluminous calcalcalic systems. So in that outline, you'll find a little bit of base metal, but mostly what you're going to find here is tungsten beryllium deposits. Wow, and Pontoc? What is that? Or how do you say that? Pentec? Yeah, that's the super system. Right, this is that dot. for that entire outline, and then the individual minerals districts are like Papago, Comabobby, Kit P, Quinlan. And each one of these ages is, is overlapping with another one, probably. Yeah. yeah, and in some cases where I have a question mark, for example, we don't have a hard radiometric date on it, so we're arguing by anal the uh, mineral assemblage analogy and the rough intrusive paragenesis that it is a paraluminous calcalcali. Wow. All right. Okay, so this is sort of what uh, Troy was talking about earlier, an empirically based correlation of magma metal series and mineral associations linked in space and time. And again, the really key thing here is we take the concept of the mineral association seriously. We did not quiz or have tea with an academic to figure out what the difference was between high K calcalcalic and medium K calcalcalic. Uh, so uh, we, we asked the mineral deposit gold-silver ratios what they had to say about it off plot in terms of a case silica diagram, and so that's how those boundaries were drawn. Right. Because they're source-based, 
they have predictivity. They're not just descriptions of copper veins versus copper replacement deposits. That doesn't tell you anything about where it came from. It just gives you a physical description. And that's not good enough to be predictive in terms of trying to find another one because the calcalcalic magma source can take several physical formats, as do all of these different magmatic sources. Paraluminous plate tectonic setting suggested flat subduction, paraluminous, steep subduction, metaluminous, deep source, shallow crustal melt source going on here. Totally different. Well, when you make that paraluminous, metaluminous distinction, you're making the most fundamental of all of them because you're ultimately determining whether it's the source of the magma and its metallogenic products was the crust or the mantle. But you're not doing that up front. That's an inference that you're making because what you really want to be doing initially is describing the thing chemically. And then from that, you can go on and say, okay, this is a tectonic setting scenario, which you're almost always doing. But, but it's, that's not the first thing you're doing. You're basically getting a chemical description of what's going on. So you've got to distinguish between description and interpretation. Mm. And as long as you keep doing that, then you won't start mixing and matching with other things and then screwing yourself up, tying yourself up in your underwear. <laughs> this is a cool one. The tools that you're getting from this are re they're regional tools, they're specific location tools. You're, you're talking pluton vectoring, elemental dispersion analysis, this stuff that you can go from to point to point from data point to point data point and then also your tools that allow you to have a regional perspective. okay yeah what we're going to be talking about today is the stuff that's highlighted in the yellow at the bottom using the classification from a regional tectonic and metallogenic analysis so this would be what most of you guys in the exploration business call area selection regional area selection got a question finding favorable areas for where these things will occur from Joey Dean, so paraluminous can be made up of a past metaluminous system. Answer to that is no. Whoa. Uh, these aren't remobilized. And I'm one of the things that came out of all of this data is that remobilization is a dead concept. Whoa. And what happens is if a new, like in the Catalinas, for example, you have 70% of it is paraluminous Eocene age magmatism. But it's intruded by uh, younger metaluminous magmatism, the so-called Catalina suite of plutons, that is not remade from the paraluminous at all. You're not redoing it, nor is the paraluminous from uh, a reconstitution of an earlier suite called the Leatherwood suite. They represent separate magmatic events generated from separate magmatic sources. Wow. wow. In one Great case, question. the wilderness sweet paraluminous is crust, and the other one is various sources in the mantle, and it all ties into the subduction zone history of what's going on in Arizona. Fantastic question. Wait a minute. There. Not done there. Okay, so Pluton vectoring, element dispersion analysis, kinematic structural analysis, detailed geologic mapping are what you do to try to determine drill target scale uh, stuff as opposed to the regional thing which allows you to select a thing at the district scale. You got a big body of rock that has statistically favorable outcome for what you're looking for at the regional scale. Then you got to do the rest of that stuff to figure out where you're going to put your drill hole to get, to get the best results. That's right. So this just shows a uh, qualitative uh, pluton vectoring study that is in the uh, Ajo pit, New Cornelia pit, showing differentiation vectors leading from the west to the east towards a stage four target that's just peeking out and uh, potentially is mineable. That is a lot of room based on this analysis for expansion of the copper play to the southeast, southeast. Wow. So, uh, Phelps Dodge, now Freeport, do not leave this district. 
that thing is chasing Great Brownfields play. a structural event that's at low pressures moving to the southwest that you're talking about. That stage four is fractionating out to the southwest because of a structural event that's taking it there. Ultimately, these are what guides in placement from a magmatic to hydrothermal scale is pressure, even more so than temperature. These things are looking for low pressure trap sites, just like the oil guys in their little anticline models, but there's a hell of a lot more going on there than just anticline traps. <laughs> so this was the, just a little quickie historical note. Our first mega chart was done in 1983, September, at the behest of Ray Morley, then of Utah, and uh, then with BHP, and now he's subsequently retired. But Rooting us on. <laughs> yeah, one of our supporters. And then uh, the most recent iteration is this 2007 version that uh, now has not only incorporated the layer Earth model, which we'll talk about in a bit, but those two little green lines up there are the serpentosphere. And that is also uh, AKA the moho. So you have continental mohos and oceanic mohos. So what was an interesting dropout from our work together on this is um, you were making the chemical distinctions, the chemical boundaries of these layers of the mantle long before you saw the seismic data or the isotopic data that correlated with this. You were doing the K57.5 Dickinson stuff with the chemistry and you were going, there's potentially a boundary at 130 kilometers. Yeah, we'll show how that was derived, but yeah, that's the geochemical model that you're pointing at. However, at the time I said, wait a minute, I think I've seen this before. <laughs> and so I went to the literature and there there it was in the geophysical literature of the time, but the geophysical literature now is can be is easily a redo of the what you see there in the left column. Nice but the time. matchup between the geophysical seismic models and, and the geochemical model was amazing. Wow. And paraluminous above the serpentosphere yeah. and metaluminous below. Yeah. Dynamic, the angry earth, as Stan likes to call it. It's not angry. Well, there's a couple things going on here. Obviously, you can see that the earth has a hot, hot, angry core, and it's very mobile. And you can see these huge thermal plumes that are spinning out of it in some of the, uh, the models of the core. That we, this is all based on empirical data and experimental data as of about the mid-2000s. Uh, we haven't really refined it since then, but we could. But it, it's based on the mantle tomography that Grand was putting out in the late 90s and early 2000s, that team. And, uh, and so the, all of those little blues and oranges are different uh, pieces of seismic tomography in terms of velocity data. This is cold, dense slab falling into the mantle. Yeah. And these are... <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how the... the the D double prime layer, which uh, Troy's yeah. pointing at, is quite mountainous in the vicinity of descending slabs. I just saw a Google, you know, notification of someone talking about these massive mountains around the core of our of our Earth. This is the D double prime? Slab. Yeah, those are big. The biggest mountains on Earth are the D, in the D double prime layer, and they're they're piled up dead slabs. Perovskite. What I looked like, yeah. <laughs> Which, by the way, is one of the most conductive materials in the mineral world. And so it easily conducts core heat, which is in those hot plume things, uh, that goes all the way as heat through the mantle. It's not some silicate magma. It's just pure heat. And it goes up and it anvils off. But, but a, a, a lesson here is to realize we've got this hot, angry core down there, and it's liberating huge amounts of heat. Right. And if those aren't influencing the surface climate, I'm a monkey's uncle. <laughs> <laughs> but well, go into the literature and see how much of that core model is yep. being incorporated in our current climate. We need to understand what's going on this planet before we start broadcasting what we think we know about climate because a lot we really be look, we need to be looking under our feet as much as we need to be looking 
up towards the sun, which typically gets blamed for everything. Right. That's a, it's interesting. We, we did a little research on the serpentosphere for that UDH webinar. So you can go to that and really talk about this incredibly massive event around the world. It's hot. Creating serpentinite is a crazy release of energy in, from the planet. And we found that researcher that did a bunch of studies and modeled how much heat, how much methane, how much stuff is actually coming from the serpentinite process. And if you extrapolate that across the basin oceans and the continents, I mean, it's just... Yeah, a, that hasn't been rigorously factored in either. And we asked the author, said, hey, is there any more future work on this? This is interesting with, you know, it's... Yeah, Troy on contacted the, the author. He said, no, that was in 2005. There hasn't been any more modern research on this process of serpentinization causing... Well, there is, but it's all just little compartments here and there. Yeah. Hasn't well, been integrated. The author that really taught you a lot about the serpentosphere, he's like, I, I didn't follow up on that. It, I don't know anybody else that's followed up on that. Going, man, that's a, that's a major study. Yeah. All right. So this little box here is the Magma Metal Series petrito Petrotonic Model. So that's that's tying the what uh, uh, what's the name of the the folks that did the core modeling? Uh, Yasuda yeah. and another lady, another yeah. person, tied to uh, now the ma the layered Earth model and why we see these anviling off features. Yeah, and, and they anvil off in a, consistently in a direction of how the Earth is twisting. And when you dial the because uh, the models have been developed independently, the the uh, Upper mesosphere and asthenosphere mantle models are from Grand. Those are tomography models. And then the uh, Yasuda dynamic mantle model are two separate studies. And what I did is I simply took the Grand model and the Yasuda model and it dialed it around to match up with the, the plumes coming out of the inner uh, core. And the, the matchup was outrageous. <laughs> and right. just one more final point. All right. You could tie that, all of this pattern, to the initiation of the Earth back at around 4.55 when a planetesimal may have hit it and started it spinning. And, uh, so, so this whole, and then that created a gravitational meltdown, which produced, finished producing the core, but especially produced the layered mantle in the first place. Wow. All right, the magma metal series classification. Source process and hydrothermal seven layered logic is kind of broken down generally like that. yeah as this thing developed uh it became clear what was related in terms of volume magma volume mass uh which would be your source of your copper and your lead zinc precious metals etc uh and what was more related to a process that allowed you to get the metals out of the out of the magma. Uh, so the wow. first several layers, the aluminum content and the alkalinity, are all about source. And this just gives you the specific diagrams that we use to uh, classify things, etc. Whereas down in the sub-series, uh, mini-series, micro-series, that has to do more with volatile that relate to process. So in effect, a magma is a silicate liquid, which is mostly can classified by the source. And most people use uh, various diagrams similar to the ones that we're talking about there in the right column to classify magmas. Alkalinity is a very popular one. Paraluminous is a real popular one. So you'll see that widespread in the literature. What you won't see in the literature is what we have a, as process, as uh, except for the AFM diagram. But we have reinterpreted the AFM diagram not to talk about so much about iron content. The iron content is more about the hydration state of the magma. If you've got hydrous magmas in there, they remove iron. Mm -hmm. If you've got anhydrous minerals in there, they, they remove magnesium, and that produces Whoa. two fundamental diagrams <laughs> on that plot, and we'll talk about that little bit later wow you can get all the details of this in the 91 keith paper yeah it's on the website uh, check that out two recommended readings the one that troy just mentioned but the other one it's a really important one here because we updated the layered mantle model considerably in there and a lot of other things 
uh, is the 1996 Keith and Swan porphyry copper. It's a lot more. It's about a lot more than what porphyry coppers are. It's about the layered earth model. It's about what porphyry coppers are not, et cetera. So wow. you'll have fun with that. That's appeared in GSN. Nice. Okay, this image we're going to continue continuously go back and forth on. We're going to talk aluminum content and go into the specifics. What are we talking about with that? Alkalinity, water content. We're going to talk about each one of these. And then the, the last part of the presentation is literally using this model, pointing out these prospects and saying, this is a viable target. And let's go claim it. I'll split it with you. <laughs> let's go claim it. <laughs> Okay, one, so the first one we're going to talk about is aluminum content, and you'll see an arrow up there that's going through the sign called serpentinization. That's kind of projecting off plot to what it's called the serpentosphere, and there's different kinds of serpentines, and depending on that, you can get different kinds of hydrocarbon deposits, and as well as other things like magnesite deposits, et cetera, et cetera. So Denebachea, the ninth mineral system that we yeah, talked about. Yeah, it's tied into this pro that process. All the metal side, graphene, all that stuff, we're talking crust mantle. No, graphene would tie into that uh -huh. serpentinization side. So too. 9 and 10 is going to be serpentinization. Mm -hmm. 1 through 8, crust mantle, making this yeah. distinction. Okay, let's dive in. Aluminum content. How'd you do this, Stan? I <laughs> do. Well, you start out in the literature at a place called Shand, uh, 19, late 20s and early 30s papers, who was basically pretty enamored with aluminum content, and he developed this concept of the AC and K index, which has survived over the years. It's come down. People still use this plot, which is the AC and K ratio versus the silica, and the full AC and K ratio in terms of what you do with the whole rock analysis is over there on the diagram on the right. So it's a molecular ratio of Al2O3 divided by its formula weight versus CaO, Na2O, and K2O. Okay. That gives you a number and you plot that. That's one of those points on there. Typically gives you a steep positive slope like you're looking at there for a typical metaluminous series. That just happens to be a representative bunch of data compiled by, well, determined by Lang for the Arizona Porphyry Copper Suite. Just to show you what the typical data looks like. And then that, the one on the left is for paraluminous muscovite granite slash plus or minus garnet plutons in, that you find in Nevada. And you can see that the two will overlap in that 1.1 to 1.0 range. This weakly metaluminous to yeah. weakly paraluminous yeah. story. And so a really important point in addition to the AC and K, especially if you're in the overlap region, is to use the mineralogy. You will not find a grain of hornblende in paraluminous rocks or pyroxene or olivine. And you will not typically find a whole rock analysis, except in a few cases, below 65 weight percent silica. Whereas in a metaluminous case, you're going to find lots of ferromagnesium minerals, like oh. hornblende, amphiboles, Whoa. pyroxenes, and olivines. Wow. So when you're looking at outcrop and you're like, oh, the data's coming back that I'm in the weekly paraluminous, weekly metaluminous. What am I in here? And you're looking at it, you could do it. By oh, yeah. You don't, you, know, you don't need this plot. It formalizes things. But, but uh, the other important thing about paraluminous magmatism is you typically do not see, only very rarely, do you see volcanism. You'd be able to see a cordiorite rhyolite. Those are like rarer than hen's teeth. And uh, whereas almost all the volcanism on the planet is a surface product of some kind of metaluminous magmatic process. Wow. Okay, aluminum content. We can make this distinction between paraluminous, metaluminous. Now we talk uh, alkalinity. Uh, I think we're a little out of place here. Go to the next slide. Yeah, this is back into paraluminous. Alkalinity, though, specifically. Yeah. Now, once you, we get two fundamentally different kinds of variation diagrams to distinguish alkalinity of paraluminous, my favorite one being the, and there's we have several other ones, but I won't bother with them, is uh, strontium versus calcium, CaO, SCAO. 
And in a subduction flow, flat subduction interaction between an ocean subducting oceanic plate, oceanic plate, not continental plate, you're typically bringing in what was uh, deposited as in melange, gray wacky melange wedges at the trench. Move your cursor to the left. The first blue guy is what's left of the melange wedge, and then it gets swept under the cordier and carpet. And it gets down into the amphibolite isograd, melts into paraluminous melts. Also, it's dehydrating huge amounts of water into the overlying uh, Precambrian to Mesozoic granitoid basement and hydrously melting that. And that's making all this blue stuff. And that's uh, mostly associated with gold. So your and your cordier and subduction flat plate interaction magmas are the calcic and the calcalcalic guys. Occasionally I get a little alkali calcic, but very rarely. So that is telling you you had flat subduction of uh, oceanic plate. On, on the alkaline side of that line, you're looking at alkali calcic and alkalic. Alkali calcic in their reduced formats are associated with your tin tungsten and granites, as the classic S granites of Chaplin White. Whereas the alkalic guy down there is in the low calcium category, and that's the French uranium granite story and, and other uranium granites that are down in Africa and other places. And those typically are made in the context of a continent-continent collision, not a continent oceanic plate collision. So the more alkaline, you're potentially in continent-continent. Yep. That's incredible. And you're going to see garnets, tourmaline, pegmatites. That's what you're going to see in these types of rocks. Right. You have now a model of flat subduction. you got a lot of water to work with. Huge so amounts of water. Water content has an a interesting story with paraluminous. Okay, a little bit more on paraluminous. Well, they have so much water in them that the water exhausts out of the pluton at, in, at mid-crustal depths, typically 8 to 20 kilometers. So you what? That's why you don't see the volcanism. Hmm. So we had in in Arizona, for example, we had uh, when we got into the flat subduction from about fifty six to thirty eight million, uh, the volcanism disappeared. A lot of people erroneously interpreted that as a magmatic gap, but in fact, what it was was a, a uh, uh, volcanic gap. And there's magmatism continuously through the whole Laramide mid-tertiary, but, but in that gap, no volcanic volcanic. gap, there, there isn't any, and that's telling you that's the period of time when you had flat plate wow. interaction. So there was plenty of high-volume paraluminous stuff going on. Wow. That is cool. Okay, then a little bit more on how you drew this boundary. Is that what you're showing here? Yeah, so that one is calcic, guys that are associated with gold deposits. And we show what they are. There's a base metal type of gold deposit that was typically a little more uh, oxidized and then another one that is arsenical, uh, which is typically a little more reduced. But they all plot in that one area on the, and if you invert that, you wind up, well, that is, the, you wind up with the uh, diagram that's colored there. but. So all of that, most of that, those points are constraining that calcic blue field. And as you can see, that's not perfect. There'll be an overlap with some of the others, but the gravity of the data plots in the calcic field. So that's how that field was drawn, and it has an empirical association with gold metallogeny. Hmm. Okay, let's move on. This is going back into the story that you're you're messing with geologic implication and using the petrochemistry to help you really hone in on that yeah but, but uh we've already kind of said that yeah metaluminous totally different than paraluminous yes as we've already made the distinction now this is the my favorite diagram to break out the alkalinity on this one is the k-silica diagram and these are pretty hard fields that 
distinguish various kinds of alkalinities in metaluminous magma series. Uh, one of my favorites on this one is the alkali calcic calc alkalic transition. The alkali calcics uh, have tricked people. They're, they're sucker plays for gold. Uh, the gold occurrences get tracked down in Nevada, and they wind up typically never being commercial if you go after this model. Hasbrook Mountain is one of my favorite examples there. Maybe it is a mine now, but it's not much of one. Um, and uh, that's south of Tonopah. And, and if you're looking at copper occurrences in alkali calcics, which we have a lot of in here, in here in Arizona, that's attracted a lot of exploration flies, and they've struck out for copper typically. Uh, Johnson Camp is one of my favorite examples there. I always get kicked by the various people that are in there, but... Uh, Go for it. Because they've been data? going for it for 100 years now, and they still haven't been able to make that into a good copper mine. <laughs> You're probably not going to change Because of all the zinc. Probably not going to change that. However, how many uh, data points do you think would plot in that for you to draw those lines? How many? What are we talking about? Hundreds? Hundreds. Hundreds thousands. Thousands of data points that have drawn these lines. And yeah, we'll see point down point. below how many we just have for the mid-tertiary, for example. Wow. Metaluminous, you're going steep subduction. Yeah. You got your so it's sampling and hydrously melting all of those different layers in the in the upper asthenosphere mantle. It's a layered mantle configuration. And unlike paraluminous, these things are not starting out wet. These things are starting out dry. The mantle is a pretty dry place. It's going to pick up its water somewhere. And when it does that... Picks it up in two places. Initial bump in the subduction zone to hydrously melt the thing but it's still relatively dry and then to get metallogenic it needs to acquire water in a tectonically mature crust which you're pointing at and then that adds it and gets it into hornblende stability which we're going to talk about and that's what leads to porphyry styles of metallogeny the good porphyry copper is copper molecules being the most well-known ones but as far as i'm concerned lead zinc copper deposits are also another version of porphyry metal pluton source metallogeny. But hornblende is present on the line in all of those. And we'll see that in a, in a minute. Wow. Okay, so let's. How, quick question. If you t run a, one of your timelines, there are time slices, right, of Western uh, United States, shows that at that time the arc, it, it suggests an where the arc was, the angle of the arc, if it's rotating, the yep. steepness of the subduction, you're getting a ton of information based on what you're seeing in these rocks across the top of the Yeah, space. and the way you do that is with the K57.5 index, and we're going to go there. Let's go on to that. That's this guy. Ah. And uh, so this is where I got started in a 1978 geology paper, which I referred to as the flapping slab paper. The editors at uh, GSA Geology Magazine initially got rejected, and that's another long story. But uh, they, they, when, it, when it finally got accepted, they said, we never rejected it because of the dinosaur that's in here, which is a fake take on what. And, of course, he's still Stills. living on our T-shirts. <laughs> And uh, but this just shows you what you can do in space and time, uh, especially if you plot the K silica chemistry. So uh, I'm showing a K up in the A thing there. Uh, you can see the uh, a K silica diagram pointing to the calcic part of the arc, which has a low K fifty seven point five number. And then as the thing starts to flatten, you move the arc variable dip flattening to moves eastward. And you're gonna first see guy that to notice this in 1910 was Lindgren. You see it right across the the, the states, right across the land. You yeah, this, this and these things out. march as a chemically banded arc. Wow. And so lighter. if you're standing, if the dinosaur is standing, grazing in one place, he'll see initial alkaline magmatism, followed by less alkaline magmatism, followed by no volcanism, which is ultimately the paraluminous story occurs in the middle but that's so i put that together back in 1978 is when it was published and one of the things that i 
didn't have time, but I obviously took some time later on. That's what became MagmaChem was that in every one of those, there was a metal association. So lead, zinc, silver was following what's the orange band on the mega chart, whereas copper and or gold, depending on oxidation state, was following the yellow band or yellow layer. And you could, uh, so I, I tracked the alkalinity of the arc by mapping the K57.5 indexes in space and time. This is just showing it in cross-section form. Now, what is the K57.5 index? It's a very famous, and I think that one of the most petrologically significant alkalinity indexes of all time developed by a geophysicist by the name of Trevor Hatherton and a sedimentologist by the name of Bill Dickinson, who unfortunately is no longer with us, but he's one of the, my great mentors, and I still miss him. But they developed that relationship. This is showing K57.5 on the x-axis versus depth. And Dickinson compiled all the chemistry and Trevor Havard and the, the uh, geophysicists compiled all of the subduction zones. And so that's the K57.5 of an andesitic volcano, for example. These are all quaternary volcanoes plotted versus the depth that it stood above the subduction zone as defined by the seismicity data. Wow. And that produces a subduction looking thing if you plot it in this format. Sure. And w since then I've gotten newer data that takes this same relationship linearly down to about 700 kilometers. Wow. So this goes all the way through the mantle. Holy smoke. 700 and that comes that's... from these really deep Ladolum, uh, Lahir, gold systems uh, on Lahir Island, they stand way above deep subduction zones. Wow, that is cool. So, so then what I did is I took the K57.5 indexes of composite data for those various alkalinity divisions and I determined the K57.5s for the boundaries of all those color bands on there. And that's the solution that you have. And then I matched it to the geophysical story, and I was obviously pretty impressed, as was the rest of the Magma Chem team. <laughs> okay, so that's alkalinity, water content, major part of the process driver. Right. Of these so systems. we've started to anticipate that a little bit, and we're going to talk about it in more detail right now. So the first way you do it is uh, you reinterpret what's known as the AFM diagram. Basically, Dear Howie Zeusman and the Scare Guard were the first ones to develop this AFM plot. And it's a great plot, but petrologists have debated forever as to what it's telling you. <laughs> Some people, it's telling you differentiation of primary magmas. Uh, some think it says water content, which is the best interpretation. And after I ask the ore deposits what they have to say about it, they clearly come down on the side of water content. And other, other people argue that it's oxidation state, and I've seen that doesn't wow. work either. But wow. the tholeitic is supposed to be reduced and the calc alkaline is supposed to be oxidized. And I've seen calc alkalic sequences that are reduced as hell, and that's your gold story. So forget that take on it in terms of a universal interpretation of that diagram. But really what it's about is the water content. So the calc alkaline trend, don't, don't confuse that with calc alkalic. That's another one of these problems in the petrologic literature that's sort of equivocated is um, you have that trend, and that's because you have hydrous minerals like hornblende and biotites and micas, and they are selectively removing iron relative to magnesium. So that flattens out the tra differentiation trajectory. They all then wind up screaming towards the alkali corner. Whereas in the tholeitic, you can call that the clinopyroxene magma series too, because clinopyroxene, which is the most common pyroxene in those rocks, is removing magnesium. And so then your residual liquids are getting more iron rich, so the thing is heading up towards the iron corner. But both of those typically are derived from the same source region in the upper asthenosphere. And that can be any of those 
source regions based on alkalinity. It could be on an alkali calcic one, a calc alkaline calcic one, you name it. Whoa. But the key is that those all start out in that part of the AFM diagram. And if you don't add water to them, they go the tholeitic iron rich trend. If you do add water to them by some process, either melting in a subduction zone, which makes them partially calcoclin, but then you really make them calcoclin if you add another shot of water by implosion in the mid crust as they're coming up into a hydrous, tectonically matured basin. Wow. Okay. So that's huge. And the same thing you can achieve on this plot, which is the silica iron magnesium diagram. That's the Myashiro plot. And that's, uh, again, annotated for, if you want porphyritic hydrous metallogeny, you want to be over in that moderately iron poor division right there. Weekly iron, you basically do, don't have a lot of epigenetic metallogeny. You do have some syngenetic metallogeny. And then the iron-rich stuff, typically you don't have anything except a few fumaroles so, so and rifting. Mag water content is m moving along magnesium and iron as it's getting more or getting less? No. It's just uh, water is the most incompatible element out there. Again, a magma is a, a, a combination, a mixture of volatiles and silicate liquid. And within that mixture, the first thing you're gonna remove that when you depressurize it is the water component. And it will take, if it's a hydrous system, the more water you have, the more it's gonna take whatever else is acting incompatibly. Not based on the water content, it's gonna be based no, on oxidation. Uh, what the whatever. minerals are picking up or not picking up with Whoa. a distribution problem. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then that will then go into the magma and then out with the water story. Wow. And the target is either going to go with the water or stay with the pluton. That's right. Whoa. So this gets into the importance of hornblende. Uh, because if you have hornblende, you've got the shot for a uh, porphyry metal expression. So when I accuse Gold Strike in Nevada, for all you GSN folks that might be sneaking into this, uh, you get you all get mad at me, and I blame the gold strike pluton for a lot of it because it's a real hornblende rich pluton. It shows a real nice differentiation trajectory that geographically leads to the thing that's in that big open pit up there called the gold strike pit, and it's none of the underground. Uh, and that hornblende pluton made a lot of gold hmm. as a porphyry gold deposit. Porgra in uh, New Guinea is uh, Papua New Guinea is another really good example of a poor free gold deposit, as are a lot of other ones. Uh, so what are you showing? What are you getting out here? You got water now. Just... So what we have here, let's go. Let's start out. We'll get into the experimental day in a minute, which is really important. But uh, the uh, so what we're doing here is we're showing the Japan Arc system. Now those dotted areas on the main island are areas of high pressure metamorphic basement that have been through dehydrational metamorphisms. Mm. And keep, keep your eye, since you're focused on that one, focus on the triangles. And you'll see that all the triangles show a very, not all of them, but they show a very strong geographic preference for that high pressure metamorphic basement. Now, when you get out into the oceanic basements, you'll see no triangles. They're all different other kinds of mineral assemblages like pyroxene, olivine, alkali olivine, basalts, mm -hmm. uh, things that do not have hydrous minerals in them. Huh. So they're dry. So your island arc tholeite magmatism one of its main features is lack of ferromagnesium hydrous amphibole minerals and or micas. Uh, so they're, they're dry. And the, the other, <laughs> the major point is if you go to uh, Guam or any of those places that have hydro, anhydrous uh, tholeitic island arc basalts, you, are, you will not see any, that's not a good place to look for metal deposits. Wow. 
unless you find one that unusually might have some hornblende in it. Wow. So something with the tectonic setting of, of this area allowed water to implode into the Yeah, system. and it's the, the metamorphic basement. You have a tectonically matured metamorphic basement that's been through some kind of thrust thickening, which has produced water. Wow. And what, Hornblad is a real water hog, as we can see over here on the right in this experimental plot from Mike Nene, and that is a really, really important paper. Uh, it does a lot of things here. But there's two major tracks that I'm emphasizing here. Mm -hmm. I'm emphasizing the dry track. Okay. Which is your pyroxene track with a maybe a little bit of biotite at the tail end. You get a little water, but, but that's non-metallogenic. It's the dry path. And that's what you see out in those oceanic island arcs, et cetera. Okay. Now, you got a metamorphic tectonically matured basement, and you got track two, which is where the magmas, as they come up through that basement, are acquiring water via high-pressure implosion of a supercritical water. That gets into the magma under magmatic conditions, and it produces hornblende. And as you can see from this vertical line on here, get your pointer out. Uh, no, go over this that guy. Uh -huh. That's the water line, basically. And on the right side of that water line, you got hornblende stable. And you've got several assemblages, which is really quite interesting. And you'll notice I've gone out here and put stage one, stage two, stage two. We have all that at Troy Ranch, by the way. Is that right? Yeah. This is, it helps you with the rock system part of the story. That's correct. Oh, so man. when hornblende disappears, that's between stage three and stage four in that little game. Yeah. That's when you release, all of a sudden you've got a water crisis problem because there's no, no mineral around that can grab the water like hornblende because mainly you've lost calcium. calcium. It's also a calcium hawk. So... That then it produces a big water release, and if you whatever's incompatible at that point will go with it. Go on with it. Wow. And in, in the case of an oxidized metaluminous calcalic sequence, that's copper and wow. modeling. Whoa. Stage three to stage, stage four. four. Yeah. Whoa. Those are the guys you want to be tracking. If you haven't got any of those in your sequence, and I, a lot of guys out there have been tracking the tortilla diorites over south of Ray and in the tortilla mountains, and if you don't have those stage three, four differentiates, you're a dead duck. Whoa, man, that's... And they've been making that mistake in that mountain range for 30 years. Wow. Ever since I've been a geologist. The horn blend stays the whole time, or what happens in the rocks in that, in that sequence? That well, you know? usually what happens is that they just crap out. They don't produce enough residual felsic liquids. So you don't get the biotite granite iorite. You need a big, large volume of biotite granite iorite and or a biotite alaskite granite, which is the stage four or five. So it's a, a volume problem? The water didn't take all the copper with it to deposit a big Well, if the volume. thing crystallizes at that point, then it's lights out and it's game over. So you got to go somewhere where that you could vector it and you can keep vectoring it to where you might find the stage three and the four. You gotta find those, and then you'll find a spatially related copper deposit. Oh man, that is cool. Okay, what are we talking here, Stan? So this just shows uh, how the crust makes its water. Okay. So the, uh, the diagram on the right, above upper, uh, sorry, upper left, uh, that's a green schist assemblage, and it has actinolite, hornblende, uh, chlorite, chlorite being the dashed lines in the middle, a uh, whole series of hydrous minerals. And then, but basically at the green schist amphibolite transition, which typically occurs around 550 degrees centigrade, that's that gap on the diagram. Then you go into where you make a whole bunch of hornblende, which has a lot less water than chloride and actinolite, especially chloride. Chloride has eight hydroxyls, hornblende has two hydroxyls. Whoa. Yeah. So, so then if you go over onto the tableized data here, that's kind of the, looking at a meta basalt in the biotite amphibole zone, and that's doing a mass count balance on all that mineralogy over there, and it calculates how much water you have at the end of the day. And then you go into the hornblende agroclase zone, which is the amphibolite facies, 
and it has 3.68, you do the difference and you've created 1.462 excess water. Everything else is isochemical if you look at the whole rock chemistry. The only thing basically that's happened here is you've lost water. And it's typically sitting as free water in cracks waiting for an arc overprint to come to that tectonically matured basement. This is from the Russian Kola Peninsula well. There's been no arc in there since that happened. <laughs> and uh, then it'll get it. And this just shows uh, wow. the Russians have backed that up with some analytical data. So the, uh, the green schist and fibrolite transition is where that dashed horizontal line is. And you can see the shift in water contents of the uh, how much less water there is in the amphibolite basement rock versus the green schist facies rock. And there's a lot of water out there in the crust. They found a lot of clean water in cracks. Wow. In that, oh, in the overpressured amphibolite crust. And just bring an arc to that, and that, that water is just going to implode into whatever that relatively wow. dry magma is. Wow, we gotta do a, a podcast or a webinar just on water. <laughs> water is it's a water planet. Incredible. So does that actually happen? Well, of course it does. <laughs> and the first place that I found that was in the Atom at Pluton up in British Columbia, but by a great paper by Peter Fox. You gotta go find that. That that's a uh, GSC uh, bulletin. And he did a great job documenting hydrous metamorphism in the atom at Pluton. And subsequently, it's been dated with zircons, and they are showing the same thing. That's really cool. Okay, so basically, the atom at Pluton is an isochemical uh, quartz monzonite to monzonite Pluton. Uh, and normally what you see on a uh, Harker variation plot, which is we're looking at various versions of here, let's look at just look K2O versus, uh, I think he's got differentiation, he's got some kind of differentiation indicator on there. And you can see that the, the more differentiated in K2O space is out of two. And, uh, oh, sorry, as a function of distance from the Pluton content. So that's two kilometers, I think. And you can see there's no change, so it's isochemical. So there's lots of different mineral phases, et cetera, but on an on a overall basis, the lines are flat. Weight percent's going up the skit. So yeah. It's K2O. Yeah, and A2O doesn't really change. Iron doesn't really change. Normally, you'll see a nice slope, hmm. but you don't see them. There's a little bit of it in magnesium. Silica's flat. And, uh, but the only thing that does change, let's go to the next plot slide and here they are in compositional space is water content so in the clinopyroxene rich core phase of the pluton go back to the that's this guy at the in the middle to keep well there and then that guy right in there yeah that's the clinopyroxene core phase so go back to that you could see and you go down to its water content which is 0.46 in the, the, the table. Okay. 0.46. And then the other ones are, are hydrated phases. The two is the transitional zone. Okay. And the three is the hydrated hornblende granite iorite to quartz monzonite zone. And you'll see that the water contents have jumped up in all of those mm -hmm. relative to the uh, dry, clear clinopyroxene core. Also, the oxidation states have changed. Hmm. So you can see that the clinopyroxene core phase is strongly reduced, whereas the other guys are, are weakly oxidized. So, so that's predicting a copper-gold expression. Now, petro so that's the chemical evidence, and now we've got direct petrographic evidence, which he's showing in these thin sections, uh, drawings. And over in the left one, you can see there your clinopyroxene core, and it's rim by hornblende, which has ilmenite in it, so it's still fairly reduced. And then here you have a pyroxene core mantled by biotite mm. and magnetite. 
which are a result of the reaction of by adding water to the pyroxene, you've destabilized it and converted it into a hydrous mineral. That routinely happens. Wow. Once I started looking for this, I've seen it just about everywhere in a typically the more mafic diuretic part of uh, the intrusive sequences that lead to porphyry metal expressions. Uh, wow. Now, uh, wait a bit, we're not done yet. So go over to this diagram where he's showing you what actually happens mineralogically based on modal point counting. So here's our uh, core phase. Go on up. That's the monzonite core reduced. That's its mineral assemblages. So plagioclase, alkali felspar, augite, hypercene, and hematite, ilmenite. Mostly ilmenite. Okay, so then we go through the transition zone into the oxidized assemblage, and then the oxidized assemblage has plagioclase, alkali felspar. Now we've got biotite, hornblende, quartz, apatite, magnetite, and we've got a rutile ilmenite. And note that we've got zircon coming in online here late in that differentiation sequence. He did not see zircon in the core phase, which is too bad. So at this line you have water available but you don't have the arc yet you don't have the you don't have that pluton well anymore. you have it so it's come up mm -hmm. it's in contact with the hydrated metamorphic tectonically mature basement okay but the water has coming in but it comes in from the outside and moves in towards the core so go on up to the map So the core phase is in the center. So what happened is the water came from the outside and it migrated in. And, and that's just a relic that didn't get hydrated. Whoa. Whoa. Okay. But when it got hydrated, also it achieved the oxidation state equilibrium with the wall rock. So that is a that's what changed wall that. rock contributed volatile fluid, yes. Wow. And that's what assimilation really is Whoa. in igneous rocks. It is not where the thing comes in and has enough thermal mass to melt the surrounding wall rocks and then achieve uh, density and viscosity equilibrium and, and to produce mixing. That does not happen. These, uh, these do not have enough energy to do that. If they get into the mid-upper crust, they are losing energy. Right. What, but... They are capable of assimilating supercritical water. It's got to be supercritical. It will be. It has to be at that point. This guy produced a little epidote uh -huh. in the biotite hornblende granite iride phase. And the important point about that is epidote has been shown to be a relatively deep mineral. Guess is this thing formed at fi all these reactions occurred at 15 to 20 clicks. Wow. Wow within the kyanite sulmonite isograd, which the pluton actually cuts in the metamorphic sequence that it's, that it's in, placed into. Wow, okay. So, but that is a very typical sequence of what you encounter in the mid-crust. Now, what happens, okay, so this shows, um, let's drop down to the next slide. Okay, so this is some zircons that were more recently. Peter Fox did his work in 1968. Uh, this is a 2005 paper. And uh, they got some zircons and finally got this thing dated, and it's 168, 66 to 168 million. But you can go further than that. The zircons started forming in the outer part of the pluton, and those are cores. If you add those cores up, you get about 168 million plus or minus 1.25. Now you'll see those white rims. Those are uh, cathode luminescent limbs. So, so they're luminescent and those are typically produced, and I've seen a lot of this, by hydrous metamorphism of the zircon. Wow. So here's another example of hydration or metamorphism under igneous conditions. And that those ages are younger as you might expect from the being on the rims, about 4 million years younger on average, 3.75 if you get technical. Um, 
And then if you look at the stuff that I've outlined in red, that's the rim data, or what he's referring to as mantle data, and that is chemically a little bit different. It's a little more uranium rich relative to thorium, and that's typical of uh, metamorphism. Uh, but you can see that it's quite different from the cores in most cases, except for that last one down there. But there's an idea that there's some kind of, and that's the fourth guy over there, and he's kind of in a mixture between the core and the rim, so it's not a clear core number like the other ones are. Uh, so that could conveniently explain that. But anyway, so that's... There's two processes going on, and it looks like the hydration of this thing took place only at a very slightly younger time during right. its emplacement, mostly under magmatic conditions. And that's really important because a lot of people have, this is another way of interpreting some of this slightly discordant zircon data. For the most part, it's concordant. Wow. Okay, let's do it. I don't know. Come back down. Do you want to oh, go back, go back to up one? to this guy. Okay, now. The diagram on the left is from Lang, and he got into the isotopes. So he did lead, lead isotopes. He did uh, samarium neodymium isotopes. Come on down to the bottom. As your epsilon neodymium numbers. And then the strontium numbers, strontium initial ratio numbers. And you can see that looking at his map up here above, he's taken these from different age provinces of and compositional provinces of Precambrian Proterozoic basement that have been intruded by porphyry copper related plutons. In other words, these have intruded different age and compositions of Precambrian basement, yet they've all produced the same metallogenic expressions and their whole rock data, which constitutes about 96 to 98 percent of the volume of the rock, mm -hmm. are all the same. So all of this isotopic noise is being produced by isotopes that were soluble in these imploding fluids from different age provinces. Wow. So these are not melt products. These are just simulated volatile products that these things acquired from the basement as they were coming through and getting up into hornblende stability. So when they got into that hornblende stability, they were able to they're quite hydrated, and they wanted it. Once they got up into the depressurizing zone, so this is the cartoon over of this whole thing over at the right. You can read this at your leisure. <laughs> Get a higher resolution one on the website, but uh, yeah, this. yeah, uh, we we needed to get that. Maybe we'll try it when we put this on the website. So we'll you got a metaluminous. There's your source melt. Yep, that's adding about two weight percent water. And it's coming through the lithospheric mantle, and it gets into the crust, which is where it is encountering all of these volatiles. And I'm showing those as little dotted things in there. Okay. Especially at metamorphic transitions, et cetera. And if there's a, a crack that it's coming out, there's typically a lot more water in the crack. So it assimilates. So that's a, sort of a wet zone. It acquires that, gets into hornblende stability, and once you've got that hornblende, when you're out there walking around the field, you're going to be paying a lot more attention to whether hornblende's hanging out in the sequence in the rocks you're walking through. You better be, anyway. <laughs> and you'll just make a note of it and just to check the list, and then. But that's a favorable, highly favorable thing. If you can't find hornblende, you bet you're in trouble, especially in the more mafic differentiates. And then this will go through a stage devolatilization. That's the differentiation story we'll be talking about later. And then it produces these different porphyry expressions. Okay, now this is, uh, again, looking at a regional scale thing here uh, that separates metallogenic arc-related data from non-metallogenic uh, rift-related data of the basin range. So when everybody knows, especially up in Nevada, that's the type locality of the basin and range. Our basin and range down here is geomorphically a little bit older. Mm -hmm. So our mountains have been pedimented a lot more. And But nevertheless, we have a magmatism here that allows you to tell whether you're metallogenic or not, especially if you've got all those black shots that are assigned to the Pinacati alkaline rock assemblages. Those are, no, that's the story over here on the right. 
And the story on the left is sort of a false positive in terms of metallogenic. It, it doesn't have any hornblende in it, so that's the point. It's is a weakly hydrated system. And those guys will show up on this diagram as relatively iron poor. So don't use these diagrams religiously. However, if it's plotting over there on the right side, then you that's get the hell out of Taj time. <laughs> uh, okay, so now you can see it isotopically in the next slide. I'll go down to below that. So a really nice way to see this is looking at the isotopes. If you see uh, relatively primitive looking strontium isotopes in this case, uh, they're down in the 7025 to 705 range typically. Uh, those are directly sampling mantle. That indicates that the pluton has not, or the magmatism has not seen any crustal volatiles. Wow. It com it's coming straight up fast up a basin and range normal fault feeder or something like that. And it might differentiate at the tail end of its thing a rhyolite. So you get this bimodal association of basalt rhyolite that petrologies recognize forever. But that shows a distinct jump up to subduction related stuff, which has seen water. And that's produced, raised the, coming from the same sources, it's raised the strontium isotopes up to above 0 0.705. And that's arc related. Now, very commonly, the isotope geologists interpret this as a uh, different kind of magma that has a different strontium isotopic source. From a magma metal series point of view, I would, this is interpreted as a, magma that could be coming from the same source, but it's just seen water mm. during its ascent. It's brought in a little bit of isotopic contamination effect. Mm. And that's typical of a subduction zone. Whereas a true rifting, you're gonna see the actual mantle value of the source in the isotopes. Wow. Now, the other thing that's <laughs> more important from an exploration point of view is that metallogeny comes up and it just stops at a wall at about 13 million. Uh huh. There's nothing of importance associated with the rift related stuff. Right. It's all related to subduction wow. and the more isotopically contaminated stuff. So, halogens, Stan. Uh, okay. Halogens. So, the thing that you use there, again, it's about volatiles but volatiles can influence the mineralogy again. So, and, and in particular, what we're talking about here is chlorine and fluorine. And uh, so that comes in, and if it's a chlorine bias track, you'll see those uh, triangles over on the left side of the chlorine-fluorine diagram. And that's an oceanic peralkaline track. And what is a peralkaline rock? That's where there's an aluminum deficiency. Uh, so that at the end of the sequence, you're making one felspar, typically in a north eclipse felspar, and that's called peralkaline at that point, whereas all the other metal luminous guys are two felspar rocks. Now, if you're doing continental, you pick up a little bit more fluorine, and that creates a sort of continental peralkaline track, and then you're if it's all fluorine dominated, that's the onganitic topaz rhyolite track, and there's a nice sample of topaz rhyolite from the Thomas Mountains in Utah, favorite with mineral collectors. And we have one oh. locality of that, well, a couple localities of that in Arizona. And you'll have to wait until the new mineralogy book, or you can get it out of the third edition, but we'll talk more about it in the fourth edition. And another thing it does to that is that it, it produces the high fluorine track is also a high rubidium track. And if you're looking for molybdenum rhyolites, uh, molybdenum related rhyolites, you want what we were just pointing at with the pointer or over there in the onganitic track. That's the molly beryllium track. Wait a minute. And then the zirconium one is the peralkaline track. So you produce a lot of zircon at the end of the fractionation sequence 
in these guys, and it raises the zirconium up into very high levels. And the normal one, which is most metaluminous rocks, is down there near the origin at less than 300 ppm rubidium and uh, 400 ppm zirconium. Wow. Aluminum, alkalinity, water, chlorine, fluorine. Pull that data out. Start organizing it with the Magma Metal Series classification. Yeah, if you start seeing anomalous, but what typically happens, and that's why you get, it's a lot easier to get rubidium and zirconium in numbers out of your geochemistry. Chlorine and fluorine take special techniques, and that's fairly expensive to do. So hmm. that's cool. The cheap way around it is the rubidium zirconium right. plot. Nice. Exploration budgets are low, Stan. <laughs> you don't have money for We stuff. know that. All right, oxidation state. Yeah, now that's another uh, process-related uh, parameter, again, that has to do with the oxidation state of the volatiles, mostly in the water. So it's the hydrogen-oxygen ratio. More specifically, it's how much hydrogen you've got that's going to influence things. Wow. And we do that on the ferric-ferrous ratio diagram. And that's the most direct way of doing it. And you can see there that when you, that's a very key boundary there where you're going through the reduced to weakly oxidized. If you're down below that in the reduced category and you're in a calcalcalic metaluminous wet magma series, you're going to start making gold or gold-based metals. Uh, if you're in the oxidized pink zones, that is magnetite stable and magnetite plus and or sphene stable. And those two guys like to eat gold for lunch. <laughs> so, and if they're operate under the magmatic oxidized conditions, then it's lights out for gold because it's all grabbed unless you want to mine gold at the th five PPB level out of a magnetite rich <laughs> pluton. Don't think you want to do that. In fact, you're going to be mining a copper deposit instead. <laughs> A lot of Arizona's copper deposits are characterized by extremely low gold numbers. But occasionally you'll get a little gold out in the halos or the peripheries, and they're sucker place for gold. California, Nevada, what are we talking, what are you pulling out here? Well, this is a thing showing why Nevada has gold. And uh, I'm superimposing the oxidation state map, which you're tracking right there. That's in the uh, coarse dots, white space dot pattern. That's the reduced crust. And uh, we've superimposed, I have a colored version of that. We need to go find it, uh, of, of ge uh, geotectonic terrains that were assembled by Silberling. Those are the different terrains. WPD, for example, go down there, is the Walker Lake terrain. And that's really kind of where the oxidized Mesozoic arc is. And there's actually porphyry coppers in that chief one being the Arrington district wow. associated with the Arrington Bathlet. But the minute you step off into the more reduced terrain, your ferric ferrous ratios go down where it's less than 0.9 and you're in gold country. Wow. So magnetite is not stable under those conditions, so gold is free to act incompatibly and partition into the hydrothermal fluid component when it leaves. And you might be at a place called Round Mountain when you do that. <laughs> All right, oxidation state. Emplacement level tectonics. We don't have a slide on this one, just a general statement, what you're talking about with emplacement level and tectonic setting. Yeah, it's not really a chemical thing. It's just a, although it may relate to water pressure at the end of the day where you're going from high level, shallowly in place systems to deep level, deeply in place systems. So basically, if you look at it from a Boddington, Lindgren point of view, Lindgren being hydrothermal, Boddington being plutonic, you go from hypabyssal epithermal to epizonal, epithermal, mesothermal. Hmm. Uh, so to mesozonal, mesothermal, to hypozonal, You're just talking about phys just depth. physically where you are in the crust. Yeah. 
after you've associated the alkalinity, water content, halogen content, oxidation state, you have all that. Now it's going to have the difference. What's the difference between the same system up to stage five or level five that is a shallow deal versus a, a well? Deal? One thing that the death thing does, uh, and the really deep catazonal is your paraluminous emplacement level, and and if you're looking at it in a crude sense. Tungsten likes to come out in deep settings. Mm. That's one thing that falls out. And there are a few other ones. Beryllium is another one. Mm. And then the shallow guys? Uh, you'll the see your precious metal epithermal systems, wow. gold and or silver. And your mesothermal base metal systems associated with epizonal, mesozonal plutons being in the mid-depth mid ranges. Wow. So... Well, okay, it's something to get into a little bit. Yeah, later. we'll put a slide together on that. You, you got yourself down in the MA, MCA, you know the oxidation state, but now if you're deep, you're going to see... Yeah, now what we're shallow. doing here is we've dropped a marble into this thing. Right, this is Troy Ranch, right? Yeah, and or Morency and or Ray, Arizona, and or the Arizona Porphyry Copper Province in general. Boom. Metal Those, that's that's what your pluton is doing for you on the way to a porphyry copper deposit. Water content, halogens. Boom. We're getting all the way. Down yeah. The so you're you're having it cross all these thresholds, and each threshold you cross increases its favorability for an economic metal occurrence of of a specific type. Because you take the Marinci and you go, okay, this is economically proven. It's a discovery. You drop that Marlboro down the whole thing, and you go, okay, got my model for the Marinci. Now I'm looking at Troy Ranch. Now I'm looking at another Yeah, prospect. it matches up with all of that stuff. If it matches up, your probability for success at that point, when you match it up, what's your, prob what's your number? Pretty high, 80%, 90%. You got an 80% chance, 90% chance. Yeah, we have a porphyry be... copper at, at uh, <laughs> Troy Ranch. It's just a question of uh, hopefully drilling it out and finding a, an accumulation that's big enough to put an open pit in. But at, before drilling, but it's already a, done it. You have a model that is suggesting you're going to get Marinci type numbers in this thing. Not necessarily. We're just, we're in that kind of a system. But we've got a diabase host rock there, so that's adding another wow. parameter to it. So yeah, it's a highly favorable system. I'm, I'm not sitting on that damn thing for 20 years for nothing. <laughs> Fractional differentiation, the rock system, Stan, when you're out there and you're actually in a full... I'm big, not trying to sell you guys anything. A big body of MCA. <laughs> Troy is. You know you're in a yellow, huge rock body, but you need to know that you're in the stage three. You need to find your way... Yeah, so you're not all the way home yet. Right. You got a fractionation problem. Troy's getting dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> stage two, stage three, stage four. Yeah, so uh, depending on where you are in this, you can do what we refer to as vectoring now. Now you're in a favorable intrusive sequence for, in this case, porphyry coppers. If you were looking for zinc, you want to be in an oxidized alkali calcic system. You want to do the same thing. You want to find quartz monzonite rather than granite diorite rock systems. It would be a, a similar drawing, but definitely different fractionation sequences. Yeah. As far as the Yeah, and you would is. fill in the box sequence there with different mineralogies. A zinc-dominated mineralogy. You'll note that I don't have any sphalerite in that one. I do have sphalerite in the stage four there. But, yeah. So that's the hydrothermal. So that, let's just explain what's going on here a little bit. So on the left labeled one through five, we have a five stage magmatic sequence. Each one of those magmatic sequences is capable of overpressuring and releasing a hydrothermal component. You got the water. Yeah, so they're all hydrous. And so that is looking at stage two. Then you go through the stage two. You got a you got a uh, you got a, a, a structural event that is now broken out a new plume. Stage. Well, yeah, but what's happening is all of this one word. It says it right down there. Fractionation chart. Fractionation. Except 
going up the left line there, we're looking at magmatic fractionation, and there's two kinds of it. Talk about that in a minute. And each one of those releases a hydrothermal stage, which also goes through a hydrothermal fractionation. Wow. Different. Now, the hydrothermal fractionation is known in the literature as alteration in metal zoning. Okay. Except that commonly a lot of these things get confused so that stage two gets blended with stage three and it's typically interpreted as a uh, halo to stage three. When in fact you can find stage three and four intrusions intruding stage two. It's cutting it. <coughs> yeah, so that proves that stage two hydrothermalism was dead and cold and then it was intruded by a stage three intrusion. Wow. And one of the things that you see in porphyry metal systems in general are a series of composite intrusive events. But it turns out they're not just there by accident. You can use the sequence of those intrusions or the stratigraphy of those intrusions to figure out where you are in these favorable sequences. So if you're in the stage two propolytic, mm -hmm. you get a little false positive calcopyrite pyrite at the end of the day there, but it's mostly about magnetite and magnetite scarns, like at the southern edge of the Arrington Bathleth associated with the McLeod Hill uh, Monza diorite. Um, and those are, and that's where the McLeod Hill Monza diorite differentiated to. Uh, but anyway, then those are cut by stage three, which are then associated with the uh, productive porphyry copper related releases. Wow, and you'll see that using cross-cutting relationships. You'll see that. Absolutely, physically. and then you can do geochemistry of, uh, of both pluton and the mineralization itself, and then you can start looking at the geography of that, and you can vector your way around in, in these the systems. Geochemistry. And the living. mineralogy, that's right. One way or the other, you're walking your way down the hydrothermal alteration with geochemistry. That's right. Targeting where you're gonna put a drill hole. That's right. So you want that stage three. Wait a minute. Get out of here. So now, if so we're talking about the stage two, stage three transition. But on the other hand, if you're up in a stage four, that's typically high, pretty productive locally veins. But the veins never, you know, they can make some nice vein districts. And a really good example of this is in the Globe Miami Superior District where you have big stage four veins. Wow. Magma vein being the most famous of them. Uh, but that is a stage four. And in that case, then what you want to do is you want to walk backwards sure. and back it down into the stage three. And what in fact happened was that Scott Mansky and Powell and others uh, working off of Don Hammer's work, uh, they knew there was something out under the day site cover. And, and I, did my own little vectoring thing. And at the time I was saying, yeah, there ought to be something a little bit under and maybe south of Oak Flat. Well, I wasn't the only one thinking that. People have got there for their own other reasons. And lo and behold, in, 60, in 98, I think it was, the Mansky uh, late stage magma team put a hole into the gigantic, one of the best copper deposits in the world called Resolution. Wow. Wow. And uh, that's the stage three. Wow. And it's a big guy, and it's diabase hosted. And I paid serious attention to that because we've got some diabase hosted sit parked right next to a stage three pluton at Troy Ranch. So uh, let's go. See what happens. Maybe we so, got another resolution. I doubt it's going to be that big. Why wouldn't it be nice? Ironically, wow. it's parked right next to the resolution tailings park. Something <laughs> right. Yeah, interesting story. Something that's developed, uh, the digitization of all this, but these polygons and the work that MagmaChem has done in the state of Arizona, you can you can easily get MagmaChem Exploration Inc. easily gets to the bottom line of an area that is MCA as yeah. a whole. But when you actually start breaking down the rock system, you can differentiate really quickly if you are in a favorable MCA. O A O three stage 
<laughs> versus that's some, right. something that's not economically feasible. Well, Chad and I did, and only in the case of the metal luminous calcocalic oxidized sequences is we broke uh, we broke them down into their staging. So we have when we broke out, we don't see it here, two threes and fours. And so the in this case we're seeing some three fours, so we're seeing a porphyry copper system at Mineral Park and it's stage three, parked uh, and cut by uh, late stage rhyolite dikes, which are associated with mineralization of four stage, in these per peripherally related uh, lead zinc silver districts associated with these stage four rhyolite dikes worm that run the whole length of the range. And that's a really nice tightly. All of that has variously been interpreted as alteration in mineral zoning, but what we see when you plug the intrusive stratigraphy into it is a stage three cut by a stage four system. Wow. So a lot of what people were interpreting as peripheral lead zinc zoning relative to the copper mineralization are in fact polymetallic veins associated with the late stage rhyolitic systems of stage four vintage. And that Mineral Park is a classic example of that. So this work has been done across the state of Arizona, also just regional geolo geology from Precambrian to present and all these major features that we were planning to go into. And I honestly gotta say, Last night when we finished this, putting this together, I really thought this was a two-hour talk. I really did. No way. Didn't even get close. I mean, we got to get there. We got to at least start introducing some of these major mineral systems that are prospecting. How, far, how deep are we into this, Paul? 1145. 1149. Like minutes or seconds. You know what? Mm. I think Jan's right. I, I think what we ought to do at this point is open it up to some questions, Q and A. Yeah, basically you've got all the PowerPoint slides ready. You just need to schedule a time when Troy can um, go over this um, as a podcast. Next week. Yeah, like maybe Tuesday. Um, when are you leaving, Troy? The following Monday. So I, but I, okay. I have work on Thursday, Friday, Saturday out on Troy Ranch, actually. Okay, so you could do it maybe Tuesday. He, what do you think? It's possible. It's possible. You put me on the spot. Now right I'm now. putting you on the spot rather than you putting me on the spot. <laughs> he drags me kicking and screaming through all of this stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah, we could do it Tuesday. We could do it Tuesday. I'm not sure exactly what time, but we'll definitely commit to Tuesday. Okay. Because this is a really good breaking point where we can just open it up to Q&A. Yeah. And, and going through the maps, the areas, and pointing out using the megametal system and all this work that's dropped out, these ages, the geology, the locations of major prospects. So you guys that are sitting there right now are lucky because you've got the preamble to what's going to happen on Tuesday potentially next week. Uh, and if you didn't hear this front end, a lot of this stuff that we're going to talk about next week will be Greek to you. <laughs> so I'm going to assume you guys heard all this one. Yeah. Now you can read those two references, and we'll have this PowerPoint here online at the end of the day. So, ha, yeah. ha, ha. so you can get prep, or if you've got friends that didn't hear this, they can they can listen to this and go through the first PowerPoint, which will be a P in PDF form, and. Uh, get ready for what's coming at you next Tuesday. Yeah. So we're, we're looking at some oxidation effects that are in the Yuma King copper scarn deposit, copper gold scarn. It's actually a Bingham analog, except it's been through some thrust metamorphism. <laughs> but uh, the people you know, like, uh, know about this. In fact, uh, A lot of the old PD hands have, have heard of this. Okay, so here we have spider web turquoise down there in the core stick. We, we found an interval of that just above the level of this chrysocolla seam in the underground working. The turquoise is uh, blow up the cross section a little bit. Okay, you can see the word turquoise there down over to your left. 
It's pointing at the core section right there. That's where that core section comes from. There's about 10 feet of it. Well, about 1.3 was giving good copper numbers. Uh, what turquoise is for me when I'm looking for porphyries is it's a argillic alteration mineral. It's typically found in late stage four argillically altered rocks. So it's, uh, whereas chrysocolla, which you're looking at there in that right, that's, there's a hell of a lot more chrysocolla here. And that's typically in the oxidized zones developed above stage threes, if you're in the right system. And it's above the copper rich zone, and then you go down into the calcocyte rich zone. Uh, let's go over to the, the calcocyte blanket cartoon. Uh, let's pull back out into the PowerPoint. We're going to talk about this next week. Um, let's see, go on up. No, it's down. Ah, oh, there it is. I got to go over to the right. That guy. So if you're, and, and most all of the copper exploration crowd knows this like the back of their hand, but it's what used to be, uh, it still is called the iron hat or the red thumbprint that sits up in the copper leach zone above a porphyry, although you don't want to get too enamored with that because it's just an iron rich gossing. And some of those are iron rich gossings above lead zinc deposits and other things. Mm. But, but the iron rich gossings above Lead zinc for me have always been a little lighter, not quite as red, and a little bit more yellow. But that's just a doesn't that's not going to work all the time. Anyway, you got a copper leach zone which comes down into, and that's your red hematites, uh, some with uh, high relief black blackish hematites, which are almost copper pitches, and tannerite, and then you get the. Uh, copper oxide in rich zone that's where your chrysocolla and your malachites hang out as per that specimen grade guy from the live oak pit and then uh, below that is the copper in rich zone which is the calcocyte secondary sulfide rich zone in red that's the black guy along with native copper it's also in that zone and malachite azurite is up in the uh, above that in the oxide zone. And then below that, all of that's developed on your primary copper sulfide primary zones, which typically feature chalcopyrite, but also you can get other things like boronite. Uh, another mm. mineral that you can get up in the oxide zone is atacamite, floating around with a chrysocolla. Also, Stan, you might say, how do you tell the difference between malachite, I mean, between chrysocolla and turquoise in hand specimen? Well, as we were looking at, if you compare this specimen with the one that's in the uh, Yama King slide set, uh, that one is a... Uh, the... Uh, Turquoise is a little bit more opaque. It's not as translucent. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, it's just not as translucent. You can see there's an opacity there that you don't typically see in high grade chrysocolla. It's interesting that turquoise. And is it's also not typically associated with malachite or azurite, whereas chrysocolla can be. Is what I was getting at, Stan, I guess is... Oh, that, there you are. Yeah, I forgot to unmute. I've been talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> was uh, you've, got, you've got to have mobility of phosphate. Very that. good point. And Stid, Stid, what Sid Williams going way back, said there were some old articles in, on uh, phosphate as a transport for copper. And what, where you get that is in stage three and stage four, and, and it's usually hanging around where appetite might be hanging around. 
So it, that's, a, that's a Sid Williams trick too, is uh, appetite. Right, the secondary appetite. Yeah. And he had different crystallographies of appetite. He had long CS appetite, and then he had stubby appetites. And I can't remember one of those is more on top of the copper, whereas the other one's more out in the propolytic alteration. So yeah, but but uh, typically you don't see the turquoise until you get into the late phosphatic, where phosphate's been mobilized, and that that's commonly in the stage four argillic. So you need mobility of the phosphate under very low pH conditions to get the turquoise. Hmm. But that's a good point, Ron. It's interesting that the turquoise told you that you were in a stage you were in stage 4. Well, it's typically late, but I've t I've never seen it in stage 2, for example. Back to that concept you can work your way back to stage 3 or whatever you look for. <coughs> When you found them. Yeah, you take these things as they come, and then what the, the cool thing about it is that they integrate into a f already integrated system. So every time you add something new to it, it just reinforces everything. Gets better and better. Hmm. Since we have Ron Luthi on the call, we might as well bring up the cracks of the world, Matt, right? Yeah, since he's a co author on it. Do you have your cracks of the world map on your wall? No, I don't. Bad I boy. It in my computer. Specifically, what we're talking about is the Texas shear, that big crack right there that goes through Arizona. Which is the north end of the Mexico shear system, which goes all the way down through Mexico to the, the thing in Yucatan. So we're talking that in regards, so there's the Mexico shear system. We're in the north part of this going through Arizona. Yeah, and this is a big part, yeah, as it was originally seen geomorphically by Ransom in 1915. And in Arizona, where that makes the cross, here's the slab tear, chemically different. Uh, you just love big pictures, drawn, stuff, don't you? Drawn, yeah. chemically drawn. Slab tree, you could see. No, it it's in not the chemically drawn. That's geomorphically drawn. You can see how it impacts in the topography. The but yeah, the way you guys saw the tears was used was the chemistry, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. It turns out if you then track the arcs in space and time, they offset across those things. Yeah, but you can also see them in the topography. The idea that they were invisible is not true. So where the Texas shear comes through. And the helix slab tear cuts on the other. Perfect. Well, you could subdivide the Arizona porphyry copper deposits. Go, go to the uh, down and let's put it, since we're still goofing off here. <laughs> we'll come back to this. Talking Over there this at slide 84. Yeah, this one. Okay, so uh, there's two fundamentally different expressions of the Arizona porphyry coppers uh, that separate by the helix slab tear. So the big part of the cluster is to the south. And it's really strongly associated with northeast striking dike or east northeast striking dikes. And, and those ellipses there are almost super systems of porphyries. But we drew this thing up in 86. I would not put Tyrone 96. in New Mexico's. Yeah, 96. So, but that's the diking in that direction is east northeast. Uh, go back to the. We have a map of the dikes. Where did Marty's thing go? Now, which one you're talking about? That one. Okay, so they're almost exclusively northeast to east northeast, and those are tensional openings along Texas own shears. So the Texas snoop was moving in left slip or left lateral, and it opened in tension on the uh, northwest-southeast axis. Now, Monty's showing northeast dikes, but there's also a lot of northwest dikes yeah. 
in these guys, a lot more than he's showing. Uh, you can see Mineral Park up there at the northwest end of things. That's the northwest trending rhyolitic dikes that are stage four. And the rhyolite, and you see a lot of preference for uh, northwest trending late stage four dikes up in this cluster that is north of the uh, shear zone of the slab, of the slab tear. And the porphyries up to the north aren't as big. Hmm. The big guys are to the south. But I wouldn't just throw Baghdad out of the out of the window, but but it's I would take a Marenzi over to a Baghdad any day of the week or a Pima district or a resolution or all the big guys are south. And it's interesting that where the slab tear crosses the northernmost one, which contains resolution. Uh, there's a stock up there, a stage two stock called the Silver King stock. It's about 70 million. And it is crawling with big hornblende crystals. Whoa. And whenever I see lots of hornblende and big hornblends, uh, you can get a pretty big down the road stage three porphyry system. And of course that's conveniently called resolution. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, we've come to an end of uh, the first 2021 webinar. We will not make the mistake again of, of presenting a half presentation. Well, wait, I want to make one more final point. Which on which point? Uh, the avicular granite story. Uh Oh, one of your favorites. I love it. that guy. Okay, so we were talking about fractionation and we were talking about the stagings. Now, there's two kinds of fractionations going on in the magmatic sequence. And I'm just showing a more dramatic one. It's not from here, but it's, it's from uh, Australia. But this is uh, what you see here are these obicular, eye-shaped, ovoid-shaped, diuretic uh, nodules, if you will that are, uh, this is a classic example of magma emissibility or liquid-liquid fractionation. So the high density phases, which are the dark stuff, almost invariably separate out as sort of bubble-like globs. And then they form, the, then they crystallize inward because with respect to the light-colored more granodiuretic matrix. Uh, so they're their own little uh, igneous system, and it's on the steps of the Suzalo Library. We need to put those up. Uh -huh. uh, they actually belched out a little bit of hydrothermal fractionate that altered the surrounding matrix. <laughs> but what happens is that those stay behind because they're the higher density phase, uh, crystallize inward, and then lights out. So that's those little blobby things there. And then the light colored stuff moves on and lives to see another day, that's stage four. And we don't see it here because we're at the stage three, four transition. But there will be, in most of the porphyry systems I've seen, if you start looking for them, you'll find another zone where those guys will act as the uh, obicular enclaves, and then you'll separate an even later phase out, in which we see a stage five dike cross-cutting the whole thing. Wow. So, uh, and that's that guy. So uh, that's the liquid liquid. Then you have what Bowen referred to as the classical Bowen's reaction series, crystal liquid fractionation. Okay, so if you go down to that lower one where you see that big bright light spot, and those two include, well, that one's fine, but those two guys up to the north are even better. And what you see there is you see these big hornblende uh, prisms crystallizing out and that's so what most rocks that you hold in your hand uh, are cr examples of crystal liquid fractionation where the the crystals are removing chemical compositions and leaving a lighter colored residual matrix which is interior to those black hornblende crystals uh, so that's the classic thing that everybody was taught in school. What is not so well known is the liquid-liquid fractionation. And what I've seen is when you have a hydrous crystallization sequence, that's when you see these liquid-liquid separations. Hmm. 
Mm. Uh, that's where you have the chance to create liquid-liquid emissibility in the plutonic sequence itself. They're typically hornblende stable, whereas a uh, you don't see orbicular granite crystallization in a uh, more mafic dry sequence, just in wet sequences. So it's just another example of possible productivity. Uh, magma, ch chili's uh, loaded with these things. Magma unmixing, you call this as well, right? Magma. Yeah, rather than magma mixing. Ironically, the literature likes to interpret it the other way around as magma mixing. But I, I interpret this from a descriptive point of view. Unmixing is an interpretation. I interpret it as magma coexistence mm. at the liquid liquid level. Mm -hmm. Man, I wanted to talk about Denebakea for a minute, but let's just save it, can it. We'll come back to That's Tuesday. because uh, Troy's an oil man. I just By fascinated heart. with the potential of what's going on up there. And it's just a crazy story in itself, but there's yeah. a lot of prospects. Well, there's a lot of diapirs, yeah. <laughs> Man. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's say goodbye. Ron, thanks for joining. Thanks for the questions and comments. Everybody, thanks for joining. And we'll do it again next Tuesday.